Hello, it's dev blog entry time once again, and this time Zexos, a community manager, has translated the Japanese version of this post, the blog entry that came out the other day. A link will be in the description if you care to read this yourself, but I'm going to skim through it. It's primarily a discussion on how bosses in the Rabanaster Alliance raid Return to Ivalice got its creatures designed, primarily focusing on Rofakale and Argus Fidalfus. It mentions how guest creators Yasumi Matsuno, the director and writer for the Yivali series, wrote the story for the raid, Keita Ememiya, the creator and designer of the Garo in-game PvP sets, and the Garo series made the actual monster designs. The artwork is absolutely phenomenal on this website, especially the illustration of Rofakale here. I love how similar this is to the older Final Fantasy series bosses, and I'm enjoying the freedom this form of design has managed to sea of recent and the dungeons since Stormblood's launch. There's something awesome about having to look at a model more than once to dissect each part of its anatomy in your mind. You make double takes or even triple takes repeatedly I'm trying to see how many creatures exactly are involved in the overall design. You see one head and then you see the rider, then you see the other head and you try to piece together its anatomy with very little look. It's exactly what I like to see, a true monster that wants to destroy you. Similar dare I say to why I like the monster designs in the Dark Souls series and to some extent some older anime from the 90s. The final image of Rovacale is a score sculpture model from inside their 3D CGI modeling software, and if they ever release these files I would love to see someone attempt to 3D print and paint this and put it on Etsy, it's really incredible, imagine that on your shelf. Next up they looked at Arga Fadalfus, the last boss in Rabanaster Raid, and all of the assets that float around with his model. The detail is incredible on the later 3D render here, and you can see the muscle tissue connecting the arms and his face with the teeth sticking out, it's absolutely incredible. It's explained that the actual render models aren't actually used in-game, and they make a bump map basically of these things, which then they assign normal texture maps on top of in-game to give details. This removes the amount of polygons that would be put into the boss if they used a raw render from the 3D modeling software, but they lose very little of the actual detail from the render, and it's more viable for cross-platform play with reduced lag from the model itself not impacting on the fight. Matsuno-san himself wrote the in-game lore for the raid, and they point out at the end here that it's a little known fact that you can in fact in-game go back to the airship after completing the Alliance raid story in Kagane, and talk to Genomis Sen Lex and Tail, who will answer questions about what we actually saw inside the raid. I want to then take this opportunity to read them out. If you enjoy lore, then stay tuned. If not, thanks for checking the video out so far. Ah, the Liberator, if even half of what Sid told me is true, your exploits would translate well to the stage. Perhaps when my life's work is done, and the secrets of Ivalis have been laid bare, I shall consider penning a new play. Alas, that day may be long in the coming, though each hour brings with it a new discovery. Forgive me, was there something you wish to discuss? And there's lots of dialogue options, so let's go through them. Who exactly was the original Ramza? As I mentioned, Ramza does not appear in the legend of Delita's miraculous rise to power. For his part in the tale, we must look to the Durai papers. My ancestor's account states that Ramza was the youngest son of one Barbanef Beowulf, the lord of a noble house of high standing. He was the same age as Delita, whom Lord Beowulf took in following the death of his parents. The two boys would have grown up together side by side, yet whilst the legends are strewn with references to Barbanef's eldest sons, his youngest is conspicuously absent. According to the Durai papers, this is because the Church of Globados branded Ramza a heretic and had his name erased from the annals of history. My research has yet to reveal why the Church would do such a thing and why his own blood would seemingly condone the act. For what it's worth, however, the author of the Durai papers was firmly convinced that Ramza was the true hero of the legends of Ivelisse, a true Zodiac brave. What was the relationship between Ramza and Delita? Delita was born into a family of serfs, the Hyrules, who tilled land owned by House Beowulf. When Delita's parents succumbed to the Black Death, Ramza's father took the boy and his younger sister Tietra into his home and raised them as he would his own children. It is at this time that I believe Delita and Ramza became friends, growing up as equals and bound by societal constraints of blood and birth. 
According to legend, Lord Barbanath was quick to recognise that young Delita's talents extended beyond working the land, and so he used his influence to secure the orphan a place at the Garriland Royal Military Academy. If the Durai papers are correct about Ramza's age, it would not be unreasonable to assume that he attended the same institution. The pair would not walk the same path for long, however. Following the untimely death of Tietra, the culmination of a tragic sequence of events set in motion by none other than Ramza himself. Delita cut ties with the house to which he had been bound since birth and pursued his ambitions alone. Who are the Zodiac Braves? Though they are virtually synonymous with Ivelis, little is actually known of the Braves and their origins. Legend has it that Delita, acting on the behest of the Church of Globados, set out with a company of knights to recover the twelve lost Zodiac Stones. This they duly did, earning themselves the moniker of Zodiac Braves. As you might expect, however, the Durai papers tell a different story. Oran claims that it was not Delita who led the knights, but Ramza Beowulf. How this discrepancy arose is yet a mystery, but one I fully intend to solve. What is Aurasite? Legend paints them as holy relics created by the very gods of Ivelis themselves. Instinct and better judgement suggest that they are similar to the ether-based crystals of the present day, but exactly how similar is something I will require more time to establish. One thing both Legend and the Durai papers agree upon is that Aurasite had the power to manifest one's deepest desires, be they fair or foul. This is born out of the fact that the stones are credited both with destroying Melonde, the city of the gods, and granting Delita the power to bring order to chaos in his kingdom. Aurasite, I conclude, is precisely as good or evil as its wielder. Who or what are the Lakavi? Ivelisian legend portrays them simply as demons, but I have a theory as to their true nature based on my own observations, and of course, those of my honoured forebear. The Durai papers tell us that when Aurasite is used with malign intent, it warps both body and mind, transforming the wielder at last into something no longer of this world. These beings, these others, are, I believe, one and the same as the twisted creatures you faced in Rabanasta. Defeating said monstrosities served to restore the Aurasite to its original crystalline state, that of the Duma, which again is consistent with the events described in my ancestors' records. Who? was Argath Fadalfus. According to legend, Argath Fadalfus, or Algus Sadalfus, depending on which version of the tale your nursemaid told you, was once heir to a high house which had fallen into disrepute through the ignoble conduct of its then lord, Agathus, grandsire. Cursing his family's diminished circumstances, the youth turned his ire upon the only souls over whom he still retained any influence, the small folk. But Delita, hero of a common man, would not suffer this, and after trying and failing to reason with Argath, put him to the sword. The Durai papers, however, tell us more. They make mention of an heirloom passed down from generation to generation in House Fidelphus, a priceless jewel known as the Duma. Upon Argath's defeat at the hands of Delita, the power of the Duma, which the young Fidelphus carried upon his person, was unlocked, and the Lucavi bound to it released. The stone duly gave form to Argath's fury, reanimating his and granting him the strength to exact revenge upon the one who ended his life. Yet who should spare Delita that fate but Ramza, who battled the vengeful corpse unbeknownst to his childhood friend, and finally brought peace to Argath's soul? Though we know better. Now you may ask why Ramza would lend his blade to the selfsame man who forsook his ties to House Beowulf. The reason lies in poor Ramza's own involvement in the murder of Delita's sister. It was Argath who fired the bolt that struck Tietra down, aye. But it was Ramza's earlier rescue of Argath that paved the way for the tragedy to follow. Though Argath was defeated and Tietra avenged, Delita's bitterness endured and festered, and it was not long before he began to blame Ramza. Ramza, for his part, understood all too well the turmoil of his grieving friend's heart, and therefore chose out of respect to maintain his distance. So the question before us remains, how and why a man twice consigned to the grave could rise again to wreak chaos, and in Rabanasta of all places? Did unscattered remnants of Argath's undying rage trigger a second reaction in the Duma, calling the Lakavi once more to our realm? Or was it something else? Something more... sinister? 
And that's where this ends. The blog entry says that this is going to be updated regularly in 4.2 and beyond, along with the new selection of storyline and indeed the next part of the raid. I'm looking forward to this even more now and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you kindly for watching and I'll see you all next time.